In today's video, we're going to be looking at the force on a wire in a magnetic field. I did a previous video on the force on charged particles in a magnetic field and magnetic field in general. So if you haven't seen that, please do go and check it out. This is sort of taking that to the next step. So let's first review what we know about the magnetic field around current carrying wires. So we looked at this in the last one and just to remind ourselves when a current passes through a wire, we get a magnetic field, a circular magnetic field around the wire. You can figure out the direction of that field based on this right hand grip rule, the picture of which you can see over here. Your thumb points in the direction of the current and then your fingers show you the direction of the magnetic field. So as you can see here, the current is upwards, the magnetic field is around in that direction. And of course, if the current goes in the opposite direction, the magnetic field switches. Remembering that it decreases in its field strength or flux density as you move out from the wire. If you then take this wire and you put it inside a fixed magnetic field, a permanent magnet, obviously you have interaction between both magnetic fields now. And we know that when you put two magnetic fields together, there's a force. Depending on the direction of the field around the wire, you're going to get a force being exerted either upwards, as you can see here, or if the current is going in the opposite direction, downwards. And the direction of that force is controlled by Fleming's left-hand rule, which we met before as well. So again, your second finger points in the direction of the current from positive to negative, remember. Your first finger points to the magnetic field from north to south, and then your thumb is going to give you the direction of the force or the direction the wire will move. If we look back at our example now, we can see that if we apply the right-hand grip rule to this, we know that the current is coming out of the page. If we then apply Fleming's left-hand rule, knowing that the current is coming out of the page, your second finger points out of the page, your first finger points from north to south, and you'll see that your thumb points, as shown here, upwards. So we use the right-hand grip rule to determine the direction of the current, and then Fleming's left-hand rule to determine the force that's going to be exerted on the wire. And again, you can practice applying Fleming's left-hand rule here. First finger points in the direction from north to south, so towards the left. Our second finger is going to be pointing in the direction of the current, so into the screen along there. And you'll find that the direction of the force is downwards, as shown. Okay, so let's think about what factors might affect the size of this force. And they're fairly obvious, or at least the first two certainly are. So the first factor is going to be the magnetic flux density, the strength of the field. If you've got a stronger field in there, you're obviously going to get a greater force because you're going to get a stronger field interacting with the field around the wire. And again, the field around that wire depends on the size of the current. So obviously, if you have greater current, you're going to have a stronger field around the wire. And again, that's going to interact more strongly with the field of the permanent magnet. The only one that's slightly less obvious is the length of the wire that's inside this magnetic field. So L, as in the length of the wire in the field, is our third factor that affects the size of the force. And the equation that governs this then is F is equal to BIL. What you have to remember, of course, is F is equal to BIL when the wire is perpendicular to the field, because the angle between the field and the wire then is 90 degrees. And the sine of 90 degrees is 1, giving you the maximum value for your force. If the wire is not at 90 degrees to the field, then you have to think about what angle it would be. So if the wire is parallel to the field, then theta becomes 0, and sine theta is 0, which means you get no force. So any wire parallel to a field line is not going to experience a force. And then any angle above that, you simply figure out what the sine theta is. So although f is equal to BIL, in fact it's equal to BIL sine theta in total. So just remembering that this applies when the wire is perpendicular to the field when theta is 90. And again, like I said in my previous video, you have to be careful about which angle you've been given. So make sure you're working with the angle between the field lines and the wire. If you're given an, uh, another angle, then you need to figure out what is the angle between the field lines and the wire. 
You can demonstrate this experiment fairly easily. All you do is you clamp a rigid wire between a magnet set up like this, pop the magnet onto a top hand balance and then zero the balance. Now this balance here is giving it in newtons, more commonly your balance would give it in grams, so you need to be aware of that. And then what you do is you're making sure that the wire is perpendicular to the field, the field would come across like this. Making sure the wire is perpendicular to the field, you just run a current through the wire. And you would increase the current, and you want to measure the size of the force. Now you measure the size of the force, depending of course on whether the field is north to south like that, or the other way around. If the field is north to south like this, then the force on the wire is going to be downwards. And so what you'll see, if you have zeroed the balance after you pop the magnets on and before you turn on the current, what you'll see is you'll get a reading, most likely in grams, on your balance here. Of course, you need to divide the reading in grams by a thousand to get to kilograms and then multiply that by 9.81, and that will give you the force that's being exerted on the wire in newtons. Remembering that the force exerted on the wire is equal and opposite to the force the wire is exerting on the magnets. So while you're measuring the force that the wire is exerting on the magnets, it will be the same magnitude for the force on the wire. So you increase the current, measure the force, you can plot a graph, force against current, and you should see that it is a straight line through the origin, and the gradient of which will be B times L. And if you know the length of the wire in the field, which is basically going to be the length of this, these magnets here, then you can find the magnetic flux density using the gradient. Now obviously we've applied Fleming's left-hand rule and used Fleming's left-hand rule for two equations now. That is, F is equal to BQV, Remembering there's a sine theta attached to all of these, we're going to assume everything is perpendicular to the field at this point and just use BQV, and F is equal to BIL. Now clearly these two equations are connected together. You need to be skilled at deriving equations from one to another, being able to connect all of your knowledge from A-level physics together. So let's see if we can get one of these equations from the other. Let's start with trying to get F is equal to BIL from F is equal to BQV. Okay, so we know that this is the speed of a charged particle through a field. And we know that speed is distance over time. So we can say that the speed is the length of the wire over the time it takes a charged particle to pass through the wire that's in the field. Giving us F is B. Q L over T. But of course, if we move the T instead of it being under the L to under the Q, Q over T is our current. So how fast our charged particle is going to move through that wire gives us current, leading us rather nicely to B I L. And what about the other way around? Can we get from B I L to B Q V? Let's try it. There are a number of ways that you can do this, and you can play with deriving the equations yourself, but we're going to use an equation that comes up in electricity. It's sort of a little side alley to the electricity topic, which is that I is equal to NAQV. So it's looking at current in terms of the flow of particles themselves through a wire, which is what we need here, because we want to take it away from general current and down into looking at the individual particles. So now, if we substitute that in for I, what do we get? B, obviously, times NAQV times L. And let's divide that up into what we want, which is BQV times N times A times L. Now, this quantity N, this is the charge carrier density or in real terms of what we're talking about here, the number of free electrons per meter cubed of the wire. So we can say that small n is the number of electrons, and normally, if we're just talking about a number of particles, we give it a capital N per meter cubed, so it's over volume. And we should also recognize that A times L here is equal to the volume. So now let's take those concepts and 
put them into this part of our equation. So we end up with f is equal to pqv multiplied by n over v times v. Of course, our v's will cancel. Now, what about the n? Well, here we're just talking about a single particle. So our n becomes 1, and therefore we are left with f is equal to pqv when you're talking about a single particle. There are other ways you can substitute here. And do play around with substituting for v, the average drift velocity, into bqv to get yourself to bil. Because one of the things that has been noticeable over the last few years with A-level papers is that they want you to demonstrate your comfort with substituting one equation into another. They'll give you something that you've never seen before as a result, and they want you to get there. It also demonstrates that you have all the parts of the A-level specification at your fingertips so that you can think about what equation might get you from one place to another because you're so familiar with the equations and you're so familiar with the content. So do practice across the A-level spectrum putting one equation into the other and seeing what you come up with. The more you do that, the more fluent you become and the easier you're going to find these more advanced questions.